This series is dedicated to Brother Steve Coakley. So when we go into the Masonic thing, I will do the best to lay to you sources from all angles because it's the extraction of the best of that. And what you will see in here is a breakdown on when the Masons dominated the Congress, which years and what did they pass? When the Masons dominated the Supreme Court, which years and what passed? You will also get John Crowes, who is buried in the house of the Mother Supreme, as well as Albert Pike. You will get quotes from them that are predominantly white supremacists, in fact, condemning black people as being animals and less than a man. These are important when you're challenging white supremacy is to know the signposts of the things they believe in so that you can always use your disqualifying statements on them. The idea of slavery as we know it is a complete lie. If we were to believe the accepted narrative, only so-called black people played the role of slave and only so-called white people played the role of slave trader. As we have detailed several times throughout this series, not all black people were slaves. And in fact, there were numerous wealthy families of free colored people for whom we have previously discussed and far more we haven't. The characteristic of using the term white to describe a free Caucasian European distinguishing itself from other classifications of race does not enter the historical record until nearly the year 1700. What was a white person in 1600? Nobody knows. What did the word American mean in 1800? What did the word American mean in 1900? What did the word fat mean in 1895? What did the word fat mean in 1995? Where did the word glizzy come from? If you check Charlatan's Web or the Urban Dictionary, they'll tell you it used to mean gun, but now it means hot dog. Yet, I got a feeling that it may transition into something else. Therein lies the problem with language. It can change overnight. Today it means this. Tomorrow it means that. Words like black and white in terms of race were never created to describe ethnicities of people but rather social classification. In fact, most so-called white people prior to 1700 were either classified by either their nationality or religion, and sometimes bloodline, but never skin tone. Classification through colorism was distinctly a concept of colonization used as a methodology for reclassifying indigenous identity for the purposes of writing Americans out of their own history. If they all believe they were brought here as slaves from across the world, they'll teach themselves to hate their homeland through their shared bondage and hardships and yearn for an imaginary place they think is home. Therefore, they'll never defend America like it's their home because they all believe they're from somewhere else. The prospect of being taken from somewhere else across the world hits a lot differently than the prospect of being captured on your own homeland. No doubt the colonizing heathen knew this, which was one of the main facets of his installation of the Virginia slave laws and black codes. Interestingly enough, most, if not all of these codes were created before the influx of so-called Africans into North America. So in reality, who are these codes written for? Now, the answer to this question isn't as clear as it may seem to be on the surface. Obviously, these codes were written for captured Indians. But quiet as kept, they were especially written for free Indians, also known as free blacks, also known as free people of color. 
the term free people of color is an amalgamation between a free Indian and a free European of some sort of mulatto, dark or swarthy skin tone. This point can't be emphasized enough. Not every indigenous American or so-called black was a slave. In truth, there has always been a significant portion of the so-called black population in America who had never been enslaved. Despite this fact, the official academic narrative of black indigenous Americans exclusively begins with the transatlantic slave trade and African slave identity. This narrative furthermore imposes the idea that all blacks misnomered as African Americans, especially in the South, only became free after the Civil War. Another idea based upon a fallacious foundation. From these fallacious foundations birthed several organizations, one of which the American Colonization Society and their Back to Africa movement, which established the country of Liberia and West Africa. The strategies of dealing with so-called blacks largely depended on which flag they were arrested under and what territories they were imprisoned from or what treaties their tribes made. The British, Dutch, Spanish, and English had various ways of dealing with their interrelationships with Indians. back with another read this one from the louisiana law review the origins and authors of the code noir this is not going to be a long read but code noir is a code instituted by the french in the americas for how to deal with indigenous people so i'm just going to read an overview of how the french dealt with slavery in the americas so the intriguing part is France had no history of dealing with slavery. So their initial approach to dealing with slavery in the Americas was a non-racist approach that at some point began to alter itself over time, of course. Quote, the Code Noir marked France's historic rendezvous with slavery in the Americas. It was one of the most important codes in the history of French codes. First promulgated by Louis XIV in 1685 for his possessions in the Antilles, then introduced in Louisiana in 1724. This code was unlike the custom of Paris, the only comprehensive legislation which applied to the whole population, both black and white. In these colonies where slaves vastly outnumbered Europeans, and slave labor was the engine of the economy as well as its greatest capital investment, the code was a law affecting social, religious, and property relationships between all classes. The code was also important as a sociological footprint for no legislation better revealed the belief system of European society including its fears, values, and moral blind spots. No legislation was more frequently amended and regularly adapted to adjust to France's evolving experience with slavery. Furthermore, perhaps no aspect of the code, whether one refers to its motives and aims, compares it to other slave systems, or questions its enforcement, is free of contemporary controversy." End quote. This article goes on to say, that the French had acquired slaves long before they had any laws on slavery. This resource says that the French began to acquire slaves in St. Christophe and other islands as early as 1635. By 1654, there were about 12,000 slaves distributed in the islands. The island of St. Christophe is now called St. Kitts. <laughs> 
So the reason that I mentioned St. Christoph or St. Kitts first is because it was one of the first places that was both occupied by the French and the English and one of the first places where they started to grow their empires. Quote from Charlatan's Web. The island originally produced tobacco, but farmers switched to sugarcane in 1640 because of stiff competition from the colony of Virginia. The labor-intensive cultivation of sugarcane was the reason for the large-scale importation of African slaves. Really. The importation began most immediately upon the arrival of Europeans to the region, even though sugarcane wasn't cultivated for another 200 years on the island, leading some to discredit the earliest claims of imported African labor. Quote, as the European population on St. Kitts continued to increase, Chief Tegramon grew hostile to the foreigners in 1626 and plotted their elimination with the help of other island Caribs. However, a native woman named Barb informed Warner and DeSambuc. I don't know what the fuck that says. One of them French, you had to put a little D on it. See, that's how, you, that's how you know some Huguenot shit right there. If you see duh on something, like if, if, if you got duh in your name or that little, you know, that little, uh, what's that, apostrophe? Yeah, that's some Huguenot shit, right? Van also, if you got van, if you have duh and van in your shit, that's some Huguenot shit. If you have van in your shit, matter of fact, I believe that Anything that starts off with Van, like Vanderbilt, is probably some Huguenot shit. May not necessarily have to be Van Built. All right, went way left. Coming on back, this quote is from Vincent Hubbard, A History of St. Kitts. Got sidetracked a little bit. Continuing, the Europeans acted by getting the Indians intoxicated at a party before returning to their village. That's some shit they do, by the way. Before they even try to set up a deal, they're just going to get you intoxicated. The Europeans acted by getting the Indians intoxicated at a party before returning to their village, where 120 were killed in their sleep the following day at a site called Bloody Point, with a ravine known as Bloody River. Over 2,000 Caribs were massacred. By 1640, the remaining Caribs, not enslaved on St. Kitts, Nevis, and Antigua, were removed to Dominica. So they killed 2,000 Caribs. We don't know exactly how many they enslaved. But we also know by 1654, according to Code Noir out of the Louisiana Law Review, there were at least 12,000 slaves in St. Kitts. So they massacred all of the natives and then imported slaves from Africa. But there are people right there. I mean, if they were going to import somebody from somewhere, wouldn't they import the people on the closest continent? Probably not. Apparently they sent boats all across the ocean. Continuing, these quotes are from the history of St. Kitts and the book Swords, Ships, and Sugar. Damn, say that fast. Swords, Ships, and Sugar. Swords, Ships, and Sugar. The island's earliest cash crop was tobacco along with ginger and indigo dye. However, production from the Caribbean and North American colonies deflated the price, resulting in an 18-month moratorium on St. Kitts tobacco farming in 1639. This prompted the production of sugar from sugarcane on St. Kitts in 1643 and on Nevis in 1648. Windmills were built to crush the canes and extract the juice. The planters grew prosperous, even rich. Where Nevis became the richest British colony in the Western Hemisphere by 1652. By 1776, St. Kitts was the richest British colony per capita. So they're making money. Island boys. 
Cause I'm an island boy and I've been trying to make Oh, I'm an island boy. They're just making that money off that sugar cane and no tobacco. Doing denture servants work among the islands. Fewer than half survived their servitude. All right, I'm, I'm done. I am done. Though indentured servants were common amongst the islands, fewer than half survived their servitude and field work required African slaves. This is an interesting sentence because they're saying that fewer than half of indentured servants survived their servitude. And field work required African slaves. When we're talking about indentured servants, we're talking about Irish people. Fewer than half survived their servitude on St. Kitts, at least, according to this. Fewer than half? And Africans, quote-unquote Africans, definitely not the enslaved natives, not them. Africans, the people they shipped from, what? not even from South America, but from Africa. Yeah, not those people, right? The Africans were required for field work. So what the hell was killing the indigenous servants if they weren't in the field? And I understand that, you know, you can't put an Irishman in the sun all day. The nigga will explode. I get it. Especially like a solid, especially an Irishman from the fog, from the foggy hills of, I don't know. There's a hill up there somewhere up in the aisles from the foggy aisles. The indentured servants, the Irish, quote unquote, Irish slaves. Fewer than half survived their servitude and they weren't working in the fields or it's assumed by this. If they weren't working in the fields, how did they die in their servitude? Like, wh what were they doing that was so dangerous? Like, it couldn't have been housework. Wasn't field work. Uh, is it barn work, maybe? Uh, all right, we could speculate all day. There were twice the number of slaves to Europeans on St. Kitts by the end of the 17th century. In 1675, the population on Nevis was about 8,000 half black. By 1780, the Nevis population had grown to 10,000, 90% black. The slaves had very harsh living and working conditions, only lasting 8 to 12 years in the field. And by the 18th century, two-fifths died within a year of arrival. About 22% died on the Middle Passage. Two-fifths died within a year of arrival. So 22% die on the Middle Passage. And another 40% die within a year? Okay. But these slave numbers, they keep growing. End quote. Charlatan's Web, History of St. Kitts and Nevis. Swords, ships, and sugar. End quote. Now, before we even get into the logic behind the importation of millions of slaves from Africa on one side of the Atlantic all the way to the Caribbean, when you actively are enslaving the natives, we must investigate the credibility of this African moniker that persists throughout all historical material referring to so-called enslaved Africans in the Caribbean. Seeing that according to their records, the Caribbean received the second most Africans behind Brazil and its proximity between the coast of North and South America, it would seem to be a logical place to start our investigation. One may find it quite interesting that the first Masonic lodges in the Americas were built in the West Indies. What also makes the Caribbean and interesting part of this analysis would be the influx of Irish Catholic castoffs and indentured servants and criminals 
for their penal colonies, who eventually become wealthy planters on the islands and end up taking their talents to the mainland in places like the Carolinas. For example, Timothy Meads of Warwickshire received a thousand acres in Carolina as compensation for servitude in Barbados. Quote, Development of Freemasonry in the Caribbean with special reference to Guyana by Dr. Harold B. Davis. Quote, it is not surprising that outside of the British Isles, some of the oldest lodges in the English and Scottish constitutions can be found in the Caribbean. This region was, after all, at the time, the prized possession of the European colonial powers of the day. Many of the early lodges were established by members of the military who have and still remain ambassadors for the worldwide spread of Freemasonry. The craft in those early days was, however, maintained by members of the colonial service, members of the planter class, influential businessmen, and merchants. End quote. Quote, Samson Gideon was a Sephardic Jewish banker who was active in 18th century London. Gideon is most prominently known for the Hanoverian Whig government's suppression of the Jacobite Rising of 1745, subsequently becoming a trusted advisor of the government who supported the passage of the Jew Bill in 1753. Historian James Picciotto, in his book Sketches of Anglo-Jewish History, described Gideon as the Rothschild of his day and the pillar of state credit. Sounds like a great guy. What did this Sephardic Jewish merchant banker Rothschild do? Samson Gideon was born at London Wall in the city of London. Second son and five children of Roland Gideon, Rohiel Abu Diente. I think it's interesting that a lot of these guys changed their names, a pattern we see even up until the Bolshevik she, who traded in the West Indies, and his second wife, Esther de Porto, was also Jewish. Daughter of Domingo or Abraham du Porto. Double names, double identities. A diamond buyer in Madras, India. A diamond buyer. I wonder if his family actually mined the diamond. They just purchased the diamonds. Samson Gideon's paternal grandfather, Moses Abu Diente, was a Sephardi born in Portugal. Lisbon, but moved to Gluckstadt, Gluckstadt, at Holstein, an area close to Hamburg, Germany, where Roland Gideon was born. Oh, he's a German. The Abu Dientes, including Roland and his father, were active as part of the elite Sephardic planter ruling class in the West Indies. Sephardic planter ruling class active in the production of sugarcane in first Barbados Antigua and then Nevis moving each time to avoid taxation Cayman the Abu Dientes made their extensive fortune from the sugarcane worked by unfree labor of enslaved Americans and European indentured servants on their plantations. Unfree. Who the fuck? Unfree. The Abu Dientes made their extensive fortune from the sugarcane worked by the unfree labor of enslaved Africans and European indentured servants on their plantation. The unfree labor. Only a fucking would even say that unfree 
Oh, you think slaves were free? Do you know how much slaves cost? That sounds like something of <sighs> unfree. You watch these motherfuckers. Slick writers. Slick mouth little bitches. It's great like that. First of all, Samson Gideon looked just like a nigga. He looked like one. Sent this nigga looked like a nigga. First of all, he looked like a nigga. Damn. He looked just like that Ross child. Boy. All he is is a mulatto. Look just like them nigga, boy. Look, they barons and everything over there. Yeah, boy. A review of the Jewish colonialists in Barbados in the year 1680. The Sephardim of the island of Nevis. Some notes on the Jews of Nevis. American Jewish Archives, 2019. Sephardic merchants allied with Cromwell and the Roundheads. I bet they did. Bet they f did. End quote. Charlatan's Web. Back on the mainland, the majority of North America at the time was not under the control of Europeans. The Spanish, Dutch, French, and British only had a small collection of forts scattered along the North American East Coast, and this was the case literally up until the 1800s. The oldest colonial cities in America, which were founded by them, St. Augustine, Florida, a Spanish fort founded in 1565, Fort Caroline, a French fort founded in 1564. Charleston, an English fort, 1670. Jamestown, 1608. Plymouth, 1630, English forts. New York was a Dutch fort, 1620. Newport, Rhode Island, 1600, a crypto-Jewish New English Portuguese fort. And even more so than protecting people, these fort cities protected wealthy merchant families and their commercial exploits. But nowhere on the mainland did they have more control than they did on the islands. Truthfully, the Caribbean became a safe haven for any trouble these people may face from hostilities regarding Indians on the continent. Don't let them Indians get too close or they'll be on the first thing paddling back to Barbados. It's important to recognize at this point the islands were far more controlled and fortified by the various flags of heathen than was the larger continent. That's why prior to 1650, there were far more immigrants to the West Indies than to the mainland colonies. Some of the oldest cities, especially in the South, cities like Charleston, Savannah, Biloxi, and New Orleans, were de facto charted out of various islands in the West Indies. It's also worth mentioning that all laws and codes concerning the treatment of so-called blacks are in direct intercourse with the statutes first employed in places like Barbados, Antigua, Jamaica, and the Bahamas. Come on, pretty mama. You know what I'm talking about? Bermuda, Jamaica. Ooh, you know what I'm talking about, man. You know what I'm talking about. I don't... Oh no, I've always gotten racist vibes from the Beach Boys. Can't explain it, but I always felt like them niggas was racist. Yeah. Yeah, the niggas just, I get racist vibes from them niggas. All right, my bad, let me, let me continue. France and Spain, who had significant presence in the Indies, 
Each enacted their own regulations in dealing with indigenous people. Francis Code Noir was invented in 1685 by Louis XIV and implemented into the French West Indies, French Guyana, and later, once they infiltrated Louisiana. The Spanish also had their laws of the Indies on which they would deal with subjugated Indians. And interestingly enough, both of their laws centered around the conversion of Indians to Catholicism, while the English laws centered around the conversion to Christianity. It's imperative to point out that Catholicism and Christianity are not the same religious practice. Christians center their worship around Jesus, a more monotheistic religion founded in pagan sun worship. Catholics center theirs around the Trinity, the Virgin Mary, and sometimes various saints, which is founded in Babylonian deism, a more polytheistic practice. Quote, Charlatan's Web, England's American Colonies in the United States. Quote, the first comprehensive English slave code was established in Barbados, an island in the Caribbean, in 1661. Many other slave codes of the time are directly based on this model. Modifications of the Barbadian slave codes were put in place in the colony of Jamaica in 1664 and were then greatly modified in 1684. The Jamaican codes of 1684 were copied by the colony of South Carolina in 1691. The South Carolina slave code served as the model for many other colonies in North America. In 1755, the colony of Georgia adopted the South Carolina slave code. Virginia's slave codes were made in parallel to those in Barbados with individual laws starting in 1667 and a comprehensive slave code passed in 1705. And remember among one of these slave codes, or what you'll come to find out, one of these slave codes is no Negro or Indian can own a Christian servant. Continuing, in 1667, the Virginia House of Burgesses enacted a law which did not recognize the conversion of African Americans to Christianity despite baptism. So we can see that Christianity can be used as a ploy for a slave to get freedom. One of the first laws on the book was you cannot enslave a Christian. The initial objective of all of these slave codes, Code Noir, the code for the Indies, was first conversion. The French and Spanish, Catholicism, the English Christianity. So by becoming a Christian, or converting to Catholicism, in theory, a slave should be free. Based off their recognition of the slave law, initially was not to enslave a Christian. And we'll also come to find that much of this history is based in the history of the Crusades. That's for another time. Or you can always tune into America is Egypt. Continuing, in 1669, Virginia enacted an act about the casual killing of slaves, which declared masters who killed slaves deemed resisting were exempt from felony charges. In 1670, they enacted a law prohibiting free Africans from purchasing servants who weren't also African. So now we're talking about free Africans in 1670. There were no Africans in Virginia in 1670. But we can see that free Africans has been manipulated through the ages for someone to think a free African is actually a person from Africa. When we know those two dozen slaves that came, that showed up on the boat in Jamestown Colony in 1619, there weren't that many more who showed up in Virginia prior to the year 1700. But already, in 1670, they have all of these codes enacted, prohibiting free Africans from purchasing servants who also weren't African. 
the prohibition is Indians, indigenous Americans purchasing Christian immigrant slaves. Read between the lines, read between the sentences. The real objective of this code is to keep who from buying who. In 1680, Virginia passed Act X, which prohibited slaves from carrying weapons, leaving their owner's plantation without a certificate, or raising a hand against Christians. Just like many of these Irish people who were enslaved, they were Catholic and they were enslaved to Christians. Reformation. This is all during the reformation of the church. The slave codes of the other tobacco colonies, Delaware, Maryland, and North Carolina, were modeled on the Virginia Code. While not based directly on the codes of Barbados, the Virginia Codes were inspired by them. The shipping and trade that took place between the West Indies and the Chesapeake meant that planters were quickly informed of any legal and cultural changes that took place. According to historian Russell Menard, when Maryland put its slave code in place, the influence of the Barbadian codes as a cultural hearth for the law is noted with members of the Maryland legislator having been former residents of Barbados, end quote. And that would go for all the legislators of the earliest colonies. They were most likely former immigrants from the islands. You imagine ships coming straight to America, right? But even the people who colonized, they colonized out of the Caribbean, meaning the earliest families in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, Pennsylvania, New York. Most of these people set up slave operations and were merchant families they set their operations and headquarters up where? In the Caribbean. Accounts in the Cayman Islands. I don't know if that has anything to do with anything. I'm sure it has something to do with something. Remember these codes were invented before the recorded influx of Africans to the colonies. The transatlantic slave trade database is supposed to be the most credible resource available when it comes to slave statistics. Let's investigate the validity of the claim that these so-called slaves are African. It has been jammed into our heads by the new woke left historical slave narrative. The first record of African slaves in the United States comes from the year 1619. We all know that other places in the Caribbean, Central, and South America had already been colonized. For example, Brazil, the place credited with being the disembarkation point for most African slaves, was colonized by the Portuguese. And they were already enslaving people a century before the Jamestown colony had even been founded. The Intra-American Slave Trade Database even documents the slave voyage of early Brazilians from the year 1550 to 1866. But when we highlight the years prior to 1619, we clearly see the Portuguese enslaving Indians in Brazil and transporting them south to Buenos Aires in modern-day Argentina. We can see this pattern continue up until at least 1650. We can also see the exorbitant amount of people on the ship being relocated with hundreds of people on a single vessel. After 1660, the pattern changes. Most of the enslaved voyages begin in Curaçao and Barbados, but instead of being exported to Brazil, most were being taken to Jamaica, and even a small number of these people were taken to the colonies in Virginia and the Carolinas we can clearly see evidence that the first disembarkations of so-called African slaves in North America were actually captured Indians from Curaçao and Barbados. Remember that prior to this same time, the numbers of Africans coming into the mainland colonies is basically null and afterwards climbed significantly. And we can also see that South Americans and people of the islands were either being taken to Panama or from one island to the other, for example, from Barbados to Jamaica, or from island to mainland, for example, 
Barbados, or Jamaica to Virginia. And this doesn't include documented records of the people who were transplanted from mainland to mainland. It's quite interesting to find substantial evidence of captured Indians embarking on ships in Brazil and disembarking in Virginia. With all this being said, none of this includes the millions of free Americans inhabiting the majority of the continent, especially in America, east of the Mississippi. These people would soon be included in the false African slave narrative. Another point that seems to have escaped the historical record are the Freemasons and their participation in the institution of slavery. If one were to scour Charlatan's web for the history concerning the relationship between the two, one may be led to believe that not only did the Freemasons not participate, but they single-handedly played the most important role in the abolition of slavery. But is there any truth to this image broadcasted across the internet? The Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania was established in 1730. The Grand Lodge of New England, 1733. The Grand Lodge of South Carolina, 1736. The Grand Lodge of North Carolina, 1771. These lodges were founded before America was even a nation. Coincidentally, the literal height of the slave trade. Are we supposed to trust the accounts being asserted all across Charlatan's web promoting the racial liberalism of Prince Hall Freemasonry? Because as early as the year 1790, 70 years before the Emancipation Proclamation, so-called blacks could become members, yet couldn't become members of white lodges? The root of this liberal racial concept is a philosophical misnomer based in clandestine elitism and separation from the average classes of so-called colored people. And of course, this is based in one simple and paramount fact that only freeborn men could even become Prince Hall Freemasons. Additionally, it's important to note Paul and his group were initiated in 1775 under the British military during the American Revolution, essentially making them British loyalists. Two other important things. As mentioned before, Hall was not American born. He was a freeborn mulatto from the West Indies. Many historians say Barbados with English or Irish ancestry in all probability, descended from the Caribbean British immigrant planter class, as is speculated from his ominously obscure background. This still doesn't answer the question why they named the Lodge African Lodge when none of them were African. It shouldn't be a surprise that Hall was one of the earliest proponents of the Two Africa Movement, labeled by scholars the Back to Africa Movement, even before the year 1800. One may wonder if there were any so-called liberal Freemasons involved in this plan. That's a rhetorical question. Of course there weren't. Remember, the American Colonization Society was created by pastors, politicians, and plantation owners as a scheme of removing all freeborn so-called blacks from America and displacing them in West Africa under the artifice of freedom and new opportunity. Well, if you don't remember... That's how countries like Sierra Leone and Liberia were literally founded by relocating free colored Americans into startup colonies in West Africa. In the case of Liberia, men like Bushrod Washington, nephew of George Washington, and Henry Clay, slave owner and grandmaster of the Lodge of Kentucky, were its most influential boosters. And what did freeborn so-called blacks think about this plan of colonizing Africa? Quote, Now after the colonization society has been formed without the consent of the colored people, after the enterprise has been violently pushed against their reiterated protest for 17 years, after its friends acknowledged that coercion has been used in getting away its victims, 
And so long as they would persuade us that this is not the native country of colored Americans and that we ought not let them remain here, what is better than a gross mockery to talk about consent? End quote. James Fortin. Remember, James Fortin was the wealthy free black in Philadelphia. Also Freemason, most likely born in the islands. Still could be an indigenous American, could possibly be a European Huguenot. The idea of an African homeland was not in the least of ways adopted by the majority of so-called African Americans. And even the opinion that they were in any way native to Africa was considered an insult, especially to men like James Fortin and Frederick Douglass. The conception of indigenous Americans adopting an African nativity didn't initially come along with the Prince Hall Freemasons, despite the fact they named their first lodge African. The majority of American Negroes could trace their generations back long before captivity on American soil and knew the colonization plot was a sham. On the other hand, this African motherland marketed philosophy for Aboriginal Americans predominates the early 20th century. Born in elite academia and pushed by Boule class members of European ancestry posing as American blooded Negroes, men like W.E.B. Du Bois in his iconic work, The Souls of Black Folk, where he suggests that the American Negro can find his roots in Africa. A blatant fallacy used to push the hidden agenda of disconnecting indigenous Americans from their ancestral roots, therefore affirming a falsely attributed African slave identity rooted in oppression. Consequently branding the idea that no so-called black Americans were ever free, and when they were, it was in Africa but nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, the majority of so-called African slaves during the era of discovery were actually white. White slaves, also known as Christian slaves because they weren't called white at the time, had been traded for hundreds of years along the Barbary Coast in North and West Africa. But for some reason, this narrative has been suppressed historically. The Arab world has a far longer history of slavery than America and Western Europe. Vikings, Jews, Khazars, Ottoman Muslims traded Christian slaves or Slavic people, hence the name, for centuries before they had even stepped on American soil. Over three million Christian so-called white slaves have been captured and sold in slave markets up until at least the year 1800. Think about that. Now, I know this may seem like a crazy question, but what are the chances of any of those so-called African slaves being brought to America actually having white skin? And if you think that's crazy, that means you think that out of the three million white Slavs or slaves in Africa, none of them were traded to the American colonies. Or maybe you don't think white slaves in Africa ever existed. In any case, you're smoking crack. Or maybe some of that new meth. If you do just a little digging into the Barbary slave trade prior to 1700, you will clearly see several documented resources citing that Christians were being captured by Khazars, Jews, and Vikings and being traded to Muslim-controlled territories around the Mediterranean coast. Quote, the main slave market was Kaffa, which after 1475 belonged to the Ottoman Empire. The town had artillery and a strong garrison of Janissaries. Besides Kaffa, slaves were sold in Kagia and Tzulu and Bethesda and Lunwe. Slave dealers came from various backgrounds, Jews, Turks, Arabs, Jews, Greeks, Jews, Armenians, and Jews. For the right to trade, they paid tax to the Crimean Khan and Turkish Pasha. In Kaffa, there were sometimes as many as 30,000 slaves, mostly from the Muscovy and the southern lands of the Commonwealth. 
Habsburg diplomat and the ambassador of the Holy Roman Empire to Muscovy, Sigismund von Herbenstein. Von. I wonder if he's part of the Vans. Of course he is. Wrote that an old infirmed man who will not fetch much at sell are given up to the Tartar youths, either to be stoned or thrown into the sea, or to be killed by any sort of death they might please. Alan Fisher describes the fate of slaves, quote, The first ordeal of the captive was the long march to the Crimea, often in chains and always on foot. Many of the captives died en route. Since on many occasions the Tartar raiding party feared reprisals or, in the 17th century, Attempts by Cossack bands to free the captives, the marches were hurried. Ill or wounded captives were usually killed rather than allowed to slow the procession. An Ottoman traveler in the mid-16th century who witnessed one such march of captives from Galatia marveled that any would reach their destination. The slave markets of Kefe. He complained that their treatment was so bad that the mortality rate would unnecessarily drive up their price beyond the reach of potential buyers such as himself. A Polish proverb stated, Oh, how much better to lie on one's beer than be a captive on the way to Tartary. End quote. According to Ukrainian-Canadian historian Orest Hlevity, from 1450 to 1586, 86 raids were recorded. And from 1600 to 1647, 70. Although estimates of the number of captives taken in a single raid reached as high as 30. That's a lot of people for one raid. Holy. Tartary. In Podilla alone, about one third of the villages were devastated or abandoned between 1578 and 1583. Michelob Light described Kaffa as an insatiable and lawless abyss drinking our blood. Besides the bad food, water, clothing, and shelter, they were subjugated to exhausting labor and abuse. According to Litvin, the stronger slaves were castrated. Others had their nose and ears slit and were branded on the forehead or cheek, and by day tormented with forced labor and by night kept in dungeons. Jews, Muslims, Armenians, Jews, and Greek traders all purchased Slavic slaves in Kaffa. End quote. Charlatan's Web, quote, The human losses during the raids in Eastern Europe were significant. According to partial statistics and fragmentary estimates, nearly 2,000 Russians, Ukrainians, and Poles were taken into slavery by Crimean Tartars from 1468 to 1694. Okay, that damn, that's 200 years. In the first half of the 17th century alone, an estimated 150 to 200,000 people were taken into slavery from the territory of Moscow State. These figures do not take into account those who were killed during the attacks. We see 2 million were taken between 1468 and 1694. Two million just from Crimea from 1468 to 1694. Not to mention any slaves in the Mediterranean. These are the Black Sea slaves, not even the Mediterranean slaves. So those estimates for white slaves might possibly be higher than even three million. And that's the funny thing about white slavery. It is definitely a part of history but for some reason, the suppression game is on one trillion. Research white slaves, you're going to be digging for quite a while before the information starts to show its hand. That is by design. White people aren't a homogenous group of people just like black people aren't a homogenous group of people. So when I say white slavery, we are really referring to certain groups of people who were enslaved. Also, the Irish were enslaved in Africa as well. On record, Jan Jansen, 
the famous New Netherland Dutch Moorish pirate raided Ireland. The Irish, you know, those Irish, he raided Ireland during the age of colonialism. Put them on a boat and sailed to Algiers in Algeria, the largest slave market in North Africa. And from Algiers, who knows? The narratives of Jan Jansen Van Harlem, a Dutch Moorish pirate, recall his many slave voyages in Iceland and Ireland. His lineage would be some of the first Dutch to settle New York, then called New Netherland. His early descendants, including one of his sons, Anthony, was described as a dark complexion mulatto of a Turkish stock. His nickname was Anthony the Turk. He immigrated to New Netherland as a colonist of the Dutch West India Company and was given land on the island of Manhattan, either through inheritance or connection to the Habsburg dynasty, which he named Wallenstein, ironically the location of modern-day Wall Street. Let's pause for a second to take a deeper look into the reality of this truth that most people have never even considered. Black pirates and white slaves. And by black pirates, specifically meaning North African Berbers of Moorish stock being black by classification of them being African and having very dark skin. The first Africans on the continent were not slaves, but rather slave traders and their descendants who got rich selling white slaves off the coast of Africa. Long before white was even a thing. The first families of New York were the descendants of that white Christian slave trade. And they themselves were not white because white is a color, not an ethnicity. And this doesn't exclude dark-skinned Huguenots or dark-skinned Sephardic Jews. The first families of New York were descendants of that white Christian slave trade and they themselves were not white because white is a color, not an ethnicity. The same as with black, two boxes at opposite ends of the gradient. The truth in the gray area used to house lies at either end. When a person thinks black in a historical context, they've been brain fucked into believing African or slave, and that history begins with colonialism. Even in the whitest place in the world, Ukraine, and the arid shadows of the Caucasus were the headquarters of world pre-colonial slavery. You had Armenians, Jews, Greeks, Bulgars, Jews, Khazars, Mongols, Jews, Turks, Tartars, and Jews selling and trading Slavs, a veritable cornucopia of Caucasians. But none of these people would classify themselves as just white although they come from the literal home of white people. Interesting note, on the skin pigment index, the whitest people on earth are actually East Asians and Siberians of the Mongoloid phenotype. Additionally, these groups in North and East Asia have the highest levels of Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA outside of Australians and certain groups in the Pacific Islands. Because although they have been reclassified, the Mongoloid, the Hindu, and the Australian, are all Caucasian by blood, with no so-called sub-Saharan African ancestry. Meaning, the scale of Caucasian runs the spectrum from white as fuck to blacker than a bitch. Skin color was not a factor in determining who was a slave prior to colonialization. 
First of all, to answer the question, were there any black pirates? Of course there were. A good estimate is that at least a third to a half of all pirates were black, and that ratio should correspond precisely with the amount of artistic depictions that have been whitewashed by historical academia. Black pirates, black slave traders, and white slaves at one time, they all existed. Some people may look at the modern day Algerian, Berber, or Moroccan person and say to themselves, these niggas ain't black. And for the most part, they would be right. But let's not forget that just like in America, the territories in North Africa have seen their own version of historical whitewashing over the last 400 years. And the current inhabitants of this region do not resemble the prior inhabitants in physical features or ancestry. The most obvious is the heavy Coco Hamite physical features seen in these current populations with minimal observable amounts of sub-Saharan DNA. The earlier populations of North Africa had much higher amounts of sub-Saharan DNA. So what exactly is a black pirate? Is he good at basketball? Does he sleep with a box fan? Can they even swim? America had its own version of black pirates, other than the black so-called pirates who were colonizing the country. In America, black pirates were usually renegades. In many cases in America, black pirates who were formerly enslaved would capture slave vessels, kill the captain, and set slaves free. A black pirate, mariner, even slave trader was most likely the norm. For hundreds to thousands of years around the Mediterranean, 300 years ago, the majority of these people in North Africa had far more so-called Negro DNA. And since then, that area has been slowly taken over by Europeans out of Southern Europe and Muslims out of the Middle East, to the point that the Caucasian and Hamitic characteristics predominate this area. Be all this as it may, we can still see the Negro blood still visible in the populations of these people today. Many of those Europeans, Sephardic Jews, Huguenots, Conversos, Moriscos, Moranos, who were expelled from Europe after 1491, these people later joined forces with those Moors and became merchants at the Dutch West India Company, Barbary pirates, slave traders, and the first Europeans in America. And no, they weren't white. A Virginia Act of 1670 states that no Negroes nor Indians are permitted to buy Christian servants. But who were these Negroes or even Indians buying Christian servants? They were the majority. This conception of pre-1700 Virginia can be portrayed more accurately by establishing that skin color was not used to determine freedom anywhere outside of the territories controlled by the Virginia Company, which at the time were only small fort cities along coastal rivers, not even 10% of the territory by the year 1700. So who was living on the other 90% of the territory? It surely wasn't Africans or the magically disappearing Tartarian Siberians. These niggas might claim all lands west to the Mississippi, but they didn't control none of that shit and their laws only held precedent in lands that they could be enforced. It would take over 200 years for enforcement to finally push these laws completely onto the native population. Ironically, prominent notorious Freemason former president Andrew Jackson may have played the most significant role in enforcing these laws when he pushed the last free tribes out of the South. This is the most important period of time in pointing out the African slave myth. The population of slaves in the South on the 1860 census was nearly 4 million, a significant jump from the 1790 and 1810 census, where the same population jumps at least 3 million. 
And since the average slave didn't live past 25 years old and had a documented negative birth rate, and the transatlantic African slave trade had ended before the 1810 census, where did these 4 million slaves come from in the 1860 census? That's a rhetorical question, of course. We know they were already here and thus not African. They were free. Mm-hmm.